I got stuff for you. Holy moly. I need to get some snakes and release them around my house. Uh, but I love eating people. I love eating kids. These guys are the scientists of the supernatural, lecturers leaving lessons for inquiring laymen. They are applying the scientific method to a world that baffles science. They are the cryptids of the corn. corn, corn. Every day that you open your mouth, I know, right? I'm more convinced that you're abducted by aliens. <laughs> no. And it just stood up. I mean, it just like kept going on and going. On. And she goes, what the, the... These are idiots. I was laughing reading this because I already knew how you would feel. Idiot. What part <laughs> of the story fits your balloon? Well, this isn't a yeah. UFO. But who else has big black wings and red eyes? <laughs> um, Batman. Oh, Mothman. Oh, yeah, Mothman. Well, everyone, I think we know exactly what it is. So say it all with me. It was the Sandhill Crane. Would you try it? No. You wouldn't eat it? No. Why? Because they're probably toxic. There'd be a lot of poop in my pants. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a six foot alligator go swing into the air and slam into a tree. Welcome back to Cryptids of the Corn. I am your host today, Jclone77. And we are not joined by with Mr. E today, but instead he is replaced with Mr. T. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Wait, not that Mr. T. The author, the famous author, Michael Thompson. Yes. Hello. I'm thrilled <laughs> to be here. That was my one thing I wanted to get in before. That was funny. When I was telling yeah. it, yeah. So, uh, That's a good one. Mr. T. <laughs> I pity the fool who don't read your books. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm dumb. So uh, <laughs> today, yes, I, again, no Mr. E today, but I am to mention while we're here, we are, uh, our Kickstarter is at this point of recording 26% funded for our Trinity's Alps giant salamander uh, expedition. Um, if you have not seen our Kickstarter video or heard about what we're doing. We are traveling. We plan to travel to the Trinity's Alps uh, in California and rediscover the giant Trinity's Alps giant salamander and put him back on the endangered Ooh. species list and bring him back from the brink. Yes. So that's exciting. So check the links below. You can, uh, uh, there's links to our Kickstarter and you can uh, donate there. Um, and CounterQuest we have coming up, I believe it is in... It is April, let me get the date just right, April 12th, 13th, 14th. Um, Crypts of the Corner will be here. MCs for the event. It's in Hamlet, North Carolina. If, you have, if you're around the area and you have plans or no plans that weekend, please come out and encounter Quest. It's going to be a great time. It was so much fun last year. And with us being your host. Uh, I can't wait to find out how to plaster cast from you guys. Oh, yes. Good. Touche. Good point. We are running a... Friday night, the night before the event starts, uh, Crypts of the Corn will be uh, hosting a casting class. So you, if you're ever out in the wild and you come across a strange print, you'll be prepared to take a foot cast or whatever cast print it may have left yeah. and, and present the evidence. Um, and then we have our merch and our merch store, our Crypts of the Corn.com. We have a bunch of new t-shirts coming out. That or that are just out that just released, like our Teddy it Roosevelt. Really good. Yeah. Oh, that they look awesome. I love the Teddy Roosevelt one. That one yeah. turned out great. I heard there's another one of me in the works, which I'm not looking forward to, but oh. we'll, see, we'll see how that comes out. And um, and then our Patreon. Where uh, if you haven't subscribed to our Patreon or joined the Corn Cult yet, you know, give us a shot. Check it out. And just and then right at the end here, just keep uh, Emily and Justin in your prayers. Uh. They are, or Emily is in the hospital right now. Um, everything's okay right now, but just keep them in your thoughts and prayers as we move forward. And I think that is it for the intro. So now let's get down to it, Michael. Okay. So today we're talking about uh, some cool, a very cool creature here. Um, one of which that was featured in my brand new book, Winslow Hoffner's High Sailing Adventures. 
And that's the second book in the Winslow Hoffner series, which is my folkloric cryptid uh, fantasy series uh, that your readers may have heard of, or if they haven't, they may enjoy. You can find out more at michaelthompsonbooks.com. And uh, we're going to be talking about the Dobarku. The have Do- you ever heard of the Dobarku? I have not heard of the Dobarku. It's also called the Irish Crocodile. Oh, okay. Oh, Irish. Yeah. We just had St. Paddy's Day recently, too. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. fitting. So it's definitely, it is fitting. It's it's in the air for sure. Um, uh, the Dobarku is also called the Doyarku, the, Dur- the Duragu, the Duragau, the Anku, the Irish Crocodile, the Master Otter, Ooh. or the King Otter. That's right. Surprise. It's not a crocodile. Aha, it's twist. A- <laughs> yes, it's a big old otter um, in most in most interpretations of it, in most uh, sightings, at least it would seem. Going back to ancient Ireland, there existed rumors of a bloodthirsty creature, a carnivorous, hound-like monster capable of chasing down its victims and ripping them to shreds on land or in the water. And unlike most cryptids that we are often seen uh, skulking the edge of our known world in solitary fashion, this one hunts in pairs, Jay. Uh Aha. Not a solo hunter, eh? That's the thing about uh, these guys as uh, we're going to unravel here. If you see one, there's usually another not far behind. So pretty interesting. Waiting in the wings, to say. Literally. Uh, The Dobarku is described as either a large uh, ferocious otter or even a canine fish hybrid. And it's the size of a dog or larger. Where where exactly are these, or where, you these know, where, are, where does the story it, come from? Ireland, yes. Okay, uh, and specifically, um, uh, there's different locks in Ireland. Um, Glenad Lock is one. We've got a little poem here that was featured in uh, Carl Schuker's uh, book, uh, "The Beast That Hide from Man," and this is by an anonymous poet, but it was from the early 1900s. It's estimated. Okay. But by Glenad Locke, tradition tells 200 years ago, a thrilling scene enacted was, to which as years unflow, old men and women still relate, and while relating dread, some demon of its kind may yet be found within its bed. Oh. This is a really scary uh, cryptid. Um, most, of the, most of the encounters with this thing uh, involve some kind of blood. Oh, okay, wonderful. Yes. <laughs> Um, but it has, uh, some interesting properties to it. It's said that it could be mystical. Okay. Yay. Could so be. In, in some stories, it has, uh, magical properties. It can charge really fast and headbutt boulders in half. Um, it has a pelt that can offer protective properties if you, uh, manage to slay it. And so there is some, there's some benefit to having a little piece, even an inch of Dobarku, uh, flesh on you as it could protect your ship from sinking, keep your house from falling down, and protect the wearer from any kind of harm. So it's like a good luck charm. Yeah, it's like a lucky rabbit's foot encrypted form. <laughs> okay. You just need an inch of it. But uh, but there's a, there's a problem because it's said that if you do manage to kill it, you will be killed yourself or you will die at least 24 hours later. Oh, so you just need to take a hunk off it and not kill it. Yeah, just ma- I guess. <laughs> just maim it. I guess. Because it's also said that if it's about to be slain, it'll give off an eerie, piercing shriek, and its mate will soon come to avenge its fallen companion. Oh, okay. So yeah, you're toast. You're, you're toast, yeah. If you even manage to, to beat one, then there's another one that's just going to come charging out of the lake or river or what have you. Another one. And a lot of that's one one of the criticisms of this thing. It's so big, and then the you know these lakes are you know not not so not so big enough to to it's said to um, support a creature of its size. But these things can book it on land, so it's also been suggested as a refutation of that that um, you know they're maybe they're transitory, maybe they move around quite a lot, mm-hmm. and they're just booking it everywhere. Hmm. How big? Did you say mention how big these things were estimated? It's been described as the size of a dog or larger. Later on, um, someone described it as like at least the size of a labrador, a labrador, if not bigger. Okay, yeah, that's a big otter. 
it's a big otter and there's um, quite a lot of depictions where its legs are a bit too long for an otter too. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, maybe that's maybe that's just a separate phenotype, you know? No phenotype, yeah. It's certainly it's certainly possible. What do you think so far? Well, it's given me vibes of, uh, and I don't even know exactly what this thing is, but a water panther here. Yeah, yeah, I was that did cross my mind. Like that when you were describing, it, that's why I asked where it was. If it was just in Ireland, because uh, it, you know, it just has it sounds like something like natives describe here. But, right. Yeah. But I wonder too if like uh, weren't uh, like the mountains in Ireland and you know Scotland that whole area in the Appalachians at one point the same mountain range. Mm, I don't know. I was thinking like in, in, during Pangaea, you mean? Yeah, like a long, long like dinosaurs before dinosaurs and all that. <laughs> um, Not I, last week. <laughs> right. Yeah. Not just last week. Because I know Justin and I have talked about it before. And he said, mm. you know, that's one of the oldest mountain ranges in the world. And that might be a reason why, you know, like Appalachians here are so like paranormal heavy. It's just because they yeah. have so much history embedded in them. And I wonder, you know, if this is something within history that's like stuck in that mountain range, wow. whether yeah. whether it's a real flesh and blood creature or something more paranormal. I don't know. That is the question. Um I've got some encounters here, if you want to hear them. Oh, absolutely. That's the best part. So this one is from 1674 in Loch Mask in County Mayo, Western Ireland. Uh, as chronicled in Carl Schuker's The Beast That Hide From Man, we have this description of a bloody encounter with the Irish crocodile, snipped from a 1684 book on West Connacht by Roderick O'Flaherty. Flaherty, pardon me. And I'm just going to read it as is here. Okay. Pardon, pardon the archaic language. Here is one rarity more, which we may term the Irish crocodile, whereof one as yet living about 10 years ago had sad experience. The man was passing the shore just by the waterside and spied far off the head of a beast swimming, which he took to have been an otter and took no more notice of it. But the beast, it seems, there lifted up its head to discern whereabouts the man was, then diving, swam. That's, I guess, a weird past tense of swam with an O. Oh. <laughs> swam underwater till he struck ground, whereupon he runned out of the water suddenly and took the man by the elbow, whereby the man stooped down and the beast fastened its teeth on his pate. That's his head, as I understand it. Oh, okay. He grabbed him by the skull. Skull, oh, yeah. Ugh, and Power dragged move. him into the... Think about the bite, you know, radius or whatever you call it, of Dra that. Right, to wrap around your head. Ugh, and dragged him into the water where the man took hold on a stone by chance in his way and calling to mind he had a knife in his pocket, took it out and gave thrust of it to the beast, which thereupon got away from him into the lake. The water about him was all bloody, whether from the beast's blood or his own or from both, he knows not. It was the pitch of an ordinary greyhound of a black slimy skin without hair, as he imagined. Old men acquainted with the lake do tell there is such a beast in it. And that stout fellow with a wolf dog along with him met uh, the like there once. Which after a long struggling went away in spite of the man and dog and was a long time after found rotten in a rocky cave of the lake as the water decreased. The like, they say, is seen in other lakes in Ireland. They call it Dov Dovarku, i.e. a water dog or Anku, which is the same. So mm -hmm. that's what the name translates to. Water dog? Um, yeah, like water hound uh, in Gaelic. Oh, sweet. I like that old, that? that old language, you know, too. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Why it did makes we... it a little scarier, doesn't it? It does. Why did we get away from that? I don't know. <laughs> so that's one of the uh, descriptions of the colorations of this thing. So bli or blimey. <laughs> Slimy <laughs> and black. Slimy and, and, and dark. Uh, this guy said the color of a greyhound. Um, okay. Okay. Shuker went on to uh, to discuss. So it was described in that encounter as like essentially hairless, um, but uh, it was it's been 
sort of discussed that perhaps it was just a short haired creature. Right. And, and uh, so can got wet. rather slick in the water. Yeah. You know. Because I can see that. I mean, I've seen actual otter or even beaver come up out of the water, and you know, they look they're soaked. I mean, exactly. You could see that as being shiny, especially if it's yeah, yeah. latched onto your head. <laughs> <laughs> that is crazy. Yeah, I can't. I think your otter panther idea is, is very is very interesting. I think that that um, or or this type of creature would lend a lot of credence to those water panther stories. Yeah. That's what you would need is a is a big otter type thing to fulfill a lot of what um, story these stories tell about water panthers. It's, it's it sounds similar at least. I mean, I don't know exactly. I still don't know what a water. I've seen the water panther stone down in a uh, Point Pleasant, Ohio. They have mm-hmm. one of those at a, uh, you know, that's the Mothman town basically where the Mothman Museum and all that stuff happened, but. They have a Chief Cornstalk's grave there, and right beside it, they have a Water Panther stone. You can't you can't tell what that thing is. I mean, <laughs> they tell you what it is, but it, I got no. Uh, it, you can't actually picture it in your head without. Hmm. It, I, if I was looking at, I would have never guessed. Oh, Water Panther, or even Giant <laughs> Otter, until they tell you. But but at least the stories behind them, from what we we've discussed them a little bit, but not much. But yeah, it just sounds very similar. At least a lot of overlap. Maybe they maybe they fulfill the same niche. Yeah, for sure. Speaking of stones, I have another encounter for you, mm. and this will later involve stones. Oh, okay. Um, this is possibly the most famous encounter of the beast, and the and the most famous uh, interpretation, I should also say, of the Debarku uh, in coloration is usually. Um, that it's it's white actually, and that it has mm. stripes, and it even very distinctly would have a a black cross sh- pattern on its back. Oh, okay, and so um, that's that's sort of the description that you would see the most. And this uh, encounter with a woman uh, named Grace Connolly in 1722 is probably the most famous Dobarku encounter. Okay. This is in Glenad, in fact. This is where that poem that we read earlier takes place uh, from Lake Glenad. And there's a few different details of this, depending on the tale that you read. But uh, this is uh, the story of Grace Connolly. Uh, the story goes that on September 22nd, 1722, a woman named Grace Connolly was either washing her clothes or bathing in a lake in County Antrim called Glenod Lock, when she was attacked by a massive beast bursting from the surface of the water. Shortly thereafter, her concerned husband, Terence, uh, came upon her half-eaten corpse beside the beast known as the Dobarku at the water's edge. So she took a while uh, to return home, and he got a little worried, and he he goes out, and when he finds her by the lake, she was half eaten and this thing is over her not how you want to find your uh spouse no terence enraged and heartbroken slays the creature he stabs it or shoots it with a rifle depending on the story uh but with its dying breath it gasps out this whistling blood curdling screech Uh oh into the lake i know what that means you know what that means It's summoning its partner. Right. As soon as it does that, a second Dobarku comes lunging from the lake. Same coloration, same size, same everything. And Terrence uh, and his brother or a friend, again, depending on the story, they flee on horseback. Um, But then they either double back or they wait for the monster to catch up. The details get a bit foggy here. Uh, And at a more opportune time, they sort of uh, ambush the creature. They they set upon it again and uh, successfully stab it to death. Oh, nice! Yes, there's another version of the story where the the horse actually gets gets up and runs and like leaves um, leaves its rider there uh, to face it alone. And in that version of the story, he has to face it like as soon as the second otter comes up. Um, but yeah, that's the that's the that's the great irony there. Um, the, the horse ran away to a um, to a village called uh, Garinard, and its name means bad horse. 
<laughs> was, was it named that before or after this story? I, I believe after. <laughs> okay, that'd make a lot more sense. Named after the, um, the abandoning horse. Yeah. I mean, what, do you blame him, though? There's a debarque coming after you. I would have ran. Yeah, uh, it, yeah, probably, probably was a good idea. But um, this husband, he went full John Wick on this otter, <laughs> and so in uh, to avenge his wife, he he takes out the first otter. But then the second otter, to avenge its partner, goes after the guy. Right, and then thank thankfully for for Terrence, uh, Terrence McLaughlin um, is believed to be his name. He managed to get the upper hand, which apparently is quite a rare feat when facing a Dobarku. He must be a tough warrior. He's probably got some history or legends written about him besides this one. Certainly. What what do you think about this encounter? So, I mean, entirely different uh, pattern, I guess, or color. Right. Um, But same same old behaviors, you know. Um, I'm glad he was able to get the upper hand, though. So we can at least hear the story, but I wonder what made these guys different, you know, with having that different uh, uh, color pattern on them. You know, I, I just yeah, I wonder if knows? it was completely different creatures. There's been, um, the, interestingly enough, and, there, and there's like one other uh, thing I'll go into. They each seem to have uh, different patterns. This is com- probably the most common or, or at least the most famous and distinct with this cross-shaped, um, cross-shaped uh, stripes on the back and, it, and mostly white. Mm-hmm. Um, and in most versions of the story, you'll find that it was a, a white creature, pale creature um, with the stripes and then black tipped ears and um, and then this black cross. It's like a, a lemur, it sounds like, or something. Yeah, yeah, kind of. Zaboomafoo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's not, yeah, that that's the friendly version. They've yeah, changed over time. Good. But what would I tell, what would you tell me, Jay? If I told you, what would you say if there was some perhaps evidence left over from this particular encounter? Oh, okay. Now that's interesting. Does perhaps he have, does he have a some, patch? Uh, something in, in 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 concrete, set in stone detail, you could say. Oh, is there actually like, I don't know, something like a footprint in concrete? <laughs> not, not, a fo- not a footprint, but... Um, just that uh, Grace Connolly herself on her gravestone has a picture of the beast carved into it. Really? Yes. Can, so, can you find? Pictures I have of a it? picture here. I can just kind of show it to you. No way. We've got okay. two. So these are two, and these are actually quite easy to find if your listeners want to uh, have a multimedia experience and look this up. What would they search? Grace Connolly, like tombstone. Gr- Grace Connolly tombstone, uh, Dobarku, perhaps. Uh, and if you if you'll look on on your side of the screen here, Jay, you'll see uh, Grace Connolly is uh, this one. Yeah, and we have the creature, and its head is sort of craned all the way backward, sort of lying flat on its spine. There, there's a little shape coming off of it, um, and this is actually a hand holding yeah. a dagger or some type of spearing weapon. Okay. That's slashing the neck of the creature. Gotcha. Okay. You can see that the legs are kind of long and like wolf-like. Right. Yeah. In the back there. And it's a little hard to see here, but the tail ha- is kind of tufted. Yeah, I can see that. So when I saw that initially, I was I was like, hmm, you know, that's that's quite quite canine. You know, could it have could it have just been a wolf? But um, looking closely at the head, the head is quite small and it doesn't quite have that houndy snout that you would expect with right. a wolf. Yep. And, you know, there were wolves in Ireland back in the day and they were known creatures. So they would have just know? known if it was a wolf. Yeah. I, I would assume, and I would, I would assume that would be the story rather than the Dobarku. Right. But we have, um, the other gravestone of Terrence. There he is riding his horse. Oh, sweet. Okay. The and he's got horse. the weapon that he used to slay the beast with. Which was? Which was uh, some type of knife, some type of dagger. Okay. Um, he's holding that. Some type of stabby, stabby weapon. <laughs> <laughs> but there he is. So not- maybe the horse didn't abandon him if he got, you know, it's if picture. he got honored in the stone as well. <sighs> well, 
Yeah, but who's going to – I mean, his reputation lives on with that town name, though, so. That's true. <laughs> it's one of the two. That's a bit more powerful than the tombstone. <laughs> Was he a good horse or a bad horse? Uh, right, yeah. <laughs> the court of public um, opinion says bad. Yeah, so I think this is this is pretty amazing. Yeah, it's physical evidence of, like, why would you put something on there if it didn't actually exist, I guess? Yeah. Unless you're – I don't know, unless you're like a storyteller or a story writer, sure. and this is your creature. Mm-hmm. But I don't think there was any mention of any of that, you know, about her being an author or something or an entertainer. Mm-hmm. The paws are also really big on this uh, creature carved into the stone here, which would probably maybe suggest like webbing, you know, like a, like big, big yeah. paws made for swimming. So I, I kind of see that. But they are quite long for an otter, the legs. But I think otters have those web hands, I think. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And they're very, uh, what's the word? They're very good with their dex- dexterous. Yeah, they're dexterous, yeah. Because I've watched they use them. tools and stuff. I watched them last uh, summer when I went fishing up in Minnesota. We had this little family of otters that lived, I had to live right around there where our cabin was. And when we'd take the fish cuts out at night, they would usually trail along. But it was a, it was like a mom and three of her kids. And she would she would grab like the biggest hunk of fish, swim it, and you could watch the whole thing. They're you know thirty forty feet from you, if not closer. She grabbed the whole chunk, swim it underwater over to where her kids were, come up on the rock, and then like lay the fish out. They'd make like this weird clicking noise, yeah. And the three little babies would come running right up onto the shore, and they just start tearing this thing apart. And mm-hmm. she'd leave and go get some more or something and come back. <laughs> but it was pretty it was pretty cool to see but yeah they would and they were they were small it's not like you know obviously the babies were small but the mom it's not something i would ever want to get tangled up with cuz no like yeah they were manipulating that the fish around like it was nothing but then they were just tearing it to shreds like it was nothing yeah they are predators you know and they are certainly quite capable uh predators and uh you could only imagine what something the size of a wolf uh, would be able to do to you. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Tear you right up. Tear you right up. Drag you away. And um, so after that, you know, you wonder, is there any any modern sightings of this thing or is this just ancient stories? Uh Uh-huh. I wonder. I'm hoping it's just ancient, but I have a feeling. They're still around, Jay. I knew it. I found some just just a little bit. So this is from uh, Carl Schuker's blog. Okay. And I'm just going to read these uh, these three little blocks here. Um, the most significant recent sighting took place during April to May of 2003 on Omi Island in Connemara County, Galway, and featured Waterford artist Sean Cochran and his wife. Omi contains two freshwater lakes and is accessible on foot when the tide is out. Sean and his wife were camping on Omi near to Fay Lock, the larger of its two lakes. When around 3 a.m. one morning, they were alerted to a strange yelping cry coming from the sand dunes at the lake's western side. Armed with a torch, they set out to investigate and encountered just two to three yards away an animal described by Sean as being larger than his pet Labrador dog. The creature speedily swam across the lake to its furthest side, where when it emerged, clambered onto a large rock and reared up onto its hind legs. In this pose, it was estimated by Sean to be around five feet tall. Wow. Now, interestingly, this is, this is actually a pose that otters, otters take when they're trying to get a vantage. Like they'll, they can sort of rear up and get straight and periscope. Kind of like a, like a prairie dog. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you'll see otters do this type of thing apparently. And so that's, that's perfect otter behavior right there. Um, in this pose, it was estimated to be around five feet tall, incredible, um, and was observed to be dark in overall color, but sporting orange-red flipper-like feet. Hmm. Yeah. It then turned away and disappeared into the darkness, leaving Sean and his wife to return to their tent, thoroughly bemused by what they had seen. Interesting. Uh, but didn't but it didn't have the white fur, right? This one. No, it didn't have the white and the stripes, like the, the mm-hmm. badger sort of decoration that the classic Barker oh, has. Didn't think about that. These yeah. modern sightings here, they've got these orange feet, and they're dark. Hmm. 
But, you know, they got to adapt to the times. Now, people were looking for the black and white thing. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me. Yeah, this is a whole new creature now. That's what they're yeah. going under that guise, yeah. <laughs> Sliding under the radar. Sure. We've got we've got a little little drawing of the monster here, if you want to see it. This is an old drawing oh, of this cool. particular. So it's you got can that. See the, the long legs, the kind of long neck. Yeah. Dark color. And like that short fat tail kind well not short but you know it's yeah. not long like a cat but it's short like a i don't know kind of like a dog i guess but thick tail really thick. yeah for sure that's pretty so what year was that did that take place 2003 so very 20 years ago 21 now Mm-hmm. very recent okay i wonder if that could i wonder if there's any other animal that could be responsible for that but or what if it was just a giant otter well, that's an interesting. We can go into explanations if you want. Unless you got more stories. Uh, no. I mean, I've got. Apparently, someone has a taxidermy. No um, way. Yes, but it hasn't been like Con thoroughly investigated. You know, so I was yeah. just going to sort of mention this in passing. There's, there's this guy. Okay. And this is, um, this is in a pub called like Heine Bar, and apparently, as of 2020, it's still there, but. As far as my research goes, no one's like plucked a hair from it or or looked at it. It's four and a half feet long. That's pretty big, and, it, and it's dark, and it has the tuftier tail than uh, otters are known to have, and it, and its legs are a little bit longer. Hmm. I wonder if uh if that is like an authentic piece, or if it's you know a, a creation, a taxidermist creation. It looks pretty dang real, though. Yeah, it's at it's it's in uh it's in County Mayo. Uh, across Molina. Um, this is all. That right. This is all Ireland still. Yeah, this is Ireland. This, it's an Irish creature, and um, there have been other uh, sightings. I I heard rumblings of, of like Scottish uh, waterhounds as well. But um, in terms of these Irish otters, there there seem to be you know all over the place, and they got these different names. I mean, waterhound just sounds frightening. It sounds pretty frightening. Yeah, I mean, Are, do you have any water hounds? Did Winslow Hoffner encounter any? Well, the Debarku itself does make an appearance. In oh, he Winslow does. Hoffner too. Yeah, I chose the um, I chose the sort of badger like striped decoration, the pale yeah. uh, otter, the big hound sized one. And um, Winslow, at a certain point in the book, is sort of uh, is sort of captured by some some uh, bad guys. This is in his younger years, and. Uh, and uh, he encounters kind of this this underground uh, bad sort of cryptid dog fighting situation, and, <laughs> and the Dobarkus are involved, um, are made made to fight for you know the entertainment of the villains. Right, you know? they're the pit bulls of the exactly underground cryptid fighting ring. Exactly, we've got them and an Icelandic. Um, what in the book I call an Icelandic sea wolf. It's it's true name. It means shell monster, uh, but it's Skelia Crimsley, I think, is the pronunciation. And and so the Dobarku are fighting that. So we've got the Irish crocodiles and the Icelandic sea wolves. <laughs> yeah, being made to fight and bite at each other. I guess I'd, you know, I'd pay to get one of those tickets. I'm curious enough to know who would win at least. Mm. <laughs> Buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it's... uh. It's 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 an interesting it's an interesting situation for sure, and um, so that's that's kind of the that's kind of the situation with those characters. It's um, it's pretty cool, and and uh, it, and it gets a little bit more Celtic in that book overall. So that's why we're we're sort of drifting. We got the Dobarku, we've got uh, the Afonk, uh, and other creatures like that, cool Celtic creatures. But in terms of explanations for the Dobarku, yes, um, okay, let's get into that. Uh, did you want to? Did you want to throw in anything first before I go down this list? Well, um, I'm still sticking to my whatever the water panther is. Or I love that. Yeah, supposed to be. I think that that's interesting. I, th I just think for some reason that's what first popped in my head. I don't mm -hmm. know why it was a an, another cryptid creature, like using a cryptid to explain a cryptid. Type oh yeah, situation. well I, I love that, but I, I think that sort of looking at water panthers in general as if they have otter origins would make a lot of sense. 
I, you scale up an otter and and yeah that would be a water panther for sure and yeah i mean ot- otters are so agile in the water um you know I, I guess most well any marmot or small mammal that lives half its life in the water it should be pretty nimble in the water but otters yeah. are pretty proficient they're decent size too but i mean not as big as a a debarku but just even mm-hmm. a bigger one i can imagine it's only going to be a little bit better like beaver beaver are so uh when they're on land it just seems like they can't move around as easy but once they're in water i mean they sh- they scoot around they shuffle around pretty pretty good right um so but with these guys i mean it sounds like they're pretty good on land too so yeah they can book it not a beaver not a beaver we can we can we can rule that out yeah definitively but I um, I don't know exactly but, besides otter I can't think of another animal that this might fall under. Well, let's talk about the otter situation. A, a large unknown otter, yeah, perhaps, um, perhaps similar to the giant river otter from South America. Okay, they live in the Amazon. They can get up to six feet long. Jay. Really? Yeah. Okay. This is a known species of otter. This is like nose nose to tail, six feet long, and as far as we know, that's the biggest otter in the world. Yeah. I wonder if that's what's in that bar. <laughs> I, I don't think it doesn't quite look like it. You yeah, know, they've got a. If you if you look these things up, they got um this sort of uh, particular coloration, white patch here, and then, uh, but they are mostly dark brown. It, it would seem okay. And even even they kind of drift into kind of a reddish uh, in in some areas. Um, but they're you know they're vicious. They're apex predators. It wouldn't happen with their feet that turns red, is it? Mm, maybe sunburn <laughs> or actually in Ireland that wouldn't make sense would it <laughs> well no yeah I don't think so or else everyone there would already be sunburn it's true <laughs> don't I know it man I, I've got that Celtic complexion you and me I, both I, pretty, I burn pretty easily I'm whiter than sour cream <laughs> <laughs> nice weird owl reference yeah you caught it <laughs> yeah, yeah. so um, uh, what about a seal Ooh, some sort of, what are those, pinnipeds? Yeah, a pinniped. Hmm. But uh, the hands and the I feet know. and the rearing, well, the rearing up, I mean, I've seen mm. seals do that. Stand up on end, but they're kind of like dog-like faces, right? Yeah. Kind of. And that would account for the sleek, slimy sort of look that some of them had, right? The True. earliest Irish crocodile account. True, the yeah. The greyhound coloration. Because seals do have short fur. But they look wet and slimy, but they're yeah. It's just the, yeah. the wetness, I guess. Yeah, and it would account for the the fish canine hybrid uh, sort of uh, talks. But you know, looking at the looking at that carving on on the yeah, gravestone, that, that's not a seal. That's that's not a seal. They got long legs, and yeah. that and that and that fluffy tail too. Oh yeah, so seal out. Well, speaking of speaking of long legs, what about it's? What if it's just a swimming wolf? Just a different, like a water wolf, like yeah, that grew to adapt, or its niche became in the water. Yeah, I mean the the last Irish wolf was killed in 1786, and there do exist types of wolves that swim and eat seafood. Oh, so for instance, the Vancouver coastal sea wolf. That swims around. It's apparently genetically distinct from what I understand. Hmm. And it eats seafood. It eats seafood, yeah. It loves it. A pescatarian. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that is, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I like it. They might it be would be this. a proper sea hound. It would be. Mm-hmm. So these are sea hounds already exist. Oops, sorry, I cut out there. Sea hounds already exist, huh? Yeah, they, they, they basically do. The Vancouver Coastal Sea Wolf. Wow, okay. What about uh, uh, the, but not sea monkeys, but like uh, like the sea, and when they're like a sea, like a water monkey or water. Uh, like oh, stellar it, sea ape? Yeah, yeah, like a sea ape, yeah. I mean, I think that was probably, that was kind of a pinniped too. I think the name was just sort of colloquial. Okay, okay. But it was described as like it didn't have those sort of front uh, flippers. Um, okay. It was like just sort of like <laughs> just had the back flippers, at least from what could be seen. So a merman, mermaid. Well, it had it had kind of a dogish head too, and like a mustache. 
Oh, okay. Something like that. It's a funny guy. It's an ugly There's mermaid. questions about whether it was, you know, legit or not, or if he was like just having a laugh, but Yeah, it could be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> who's gonna who's gonna discredit him though? I mean, come on, back then. Um, I can't I can't call to mind any aquatic primates, um, besides, you know, mer beings. Can you? Right, yeah. I mean, I thought there was something that was like a primitive, I don't know, ape monkey hominid, I don't know, that mm-hmm. spent a lot of its time in the water on the coast or something, but I Oof. may be getting that confused with something else. I do Can you that. imagine like a swimming like something like a baboon, you know, that would be scary. Yeah, it would be. Mm-hmm. So speaking of scary, what if it's what if it is just something supernatural? Mm. That's why, the, uh, honestly, when I, when uh, the, that white and black one, um, that seemed like it could be to me for some reason, but if it's it has flesh, a cross on it too. Yeah. Which is just odd. I mean, but I guess, I don't, I guess I could see that pattern in nature, I suppose. There's strange patterns in nature. I can see it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but with its, you know, it's shriek for its partner. I mean, yeah. it's like they're working in tandem. Is that really two things like that are that connected or is it that's still that same kind of entity? There's just. Yeah. I mean, you know, there are, uh, there are stories of this thing with a strange connection to uh, the werewolf myth that you can only kill it with a silver bullet. Oh, really? Okay. It, kind of interesting. And then it's good luck uh, fur patch too. Yeah. That's yeah. a little supernatural on top of it. However, Grace Connolly's husband was able to just stab the thing to death, so that kind of puts that to rest, if that story is to be believed. Right, true, yeah. So it brings it back into the flesh and blood a little bit. Yeah. But did he, uh, did he, one, did he save any of the fur? <laughs> or two, did he, uh, was he, did he meet his demise shortly after? I don't think it was shortly after. So maybe he um, didn't keep the fur. That's why he was safe. <laughs> you got to bury the thing know. and return it to Earth. From everything that I've heard, I kind of think that this is still in the realm of otter, mm-hmm. and um, and I think and all of the supernatural stuff could be, just be you know uh, aggrandizement. Right. I mean, there's there's other stories that it could command like an army of a hundred regular sized otters and stuff. <laughs> that would be frightening. That would be cool. The otter um, king. Yeah, the otter king. That's what they call. That's why they call it that, um, the king otter. But in very recent years, a new species of otter has been discovered, mm. a prehistoric species of otter. Jay, um, in 2017, in the Journal of Systematic Paleontology, uh, findings were published of a new species of prehistoric otter named uh, Siamagale melalutra, and uh, its name melalutra comes from melis, meaning badger. And Lutra meaning otter. Uh huh. A badger otter. Which would explain the the white stripes. Well, or- I I don't know if it uh, if it determines uh, its coloration, but I, I do like that connection. Um, the the it's mostly from its teeth that it sort of derived that name. Its skull mm-hmm. and teeth had had blended characteristics. Um, it lived six point two four million years ago in the Yunnan province of China. Weighed approximately 110 pounds. Oh. And was roughly the size of a modern wolf. Okay. So a badger mm-hmm. otter is even more scary. Badger otter, it would be scary. Um, and uh, listen to this. Uh, uh, Denise Sue, PhD, says, The reason why we chose these names and combined them together is because the species has a mix of characteristics of both these animals and its skull and its teeth. And the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles paleontologist Xiaoming Wang explains, it has the skull of an otter, but shares many dental similarities with badgers, which is why we called it Melalutra, which is Latin for badger otter. Mm. Okay. From the Smithsonian Magazine, the fossil otter is larger than all living otters. This is according to Wang. Yet, although many meat-eating mammals evolve larger sizes to tackle tackle bigger prey, <clears throat> pardon me, tackle bigger prey. Wang says he expects that the size of Simagel owes to a different cause. The mammal's teeth hint that Simagel was a mollusk eater, Wang points out, similar to modern sea otters. But while sea otters use rocks to crack open their hard-shelled food, 
it's unlikely that Simon Gale did the same. Quote, perhaps our fossil otter has not learned to use rocks and instead applied brute strength to crush hard shells. So just this one it. didn't use tools. It just, its jaws were just that strong. Yeah. That positing. Huh. It just crushed things. Right. Didn't need the tools. Didn't it, need them. It was the tool. Uh, yes, it was the right tool for the job. <laughs> huh. So, okay. So we got, you know, this sounds very fi- similar to the, to the, uh, Debarku. It does. Hmm. So, okay. What if the Debarku then is just a, uh, I guess a long lost, you know, on the brink of extinction animal that's just still somehow hanging on in the shadows. It could mm-hmm. could be something like that. It could be, what if it slipped through like a time slip mm. and, from way back, you know, when, and it's here now. And, that's, and maybe that's, you know, once you go through a time slip, you automatically get mystical powers and abilities. I think that just comes with the territory. So wow. you, I think <laughs> I'm definitely not adding lore here, but... Hey, that's that's I like that lore though. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to make it fit and work. I think yeah, you've you've successfully combined all of them. See, yeah, what if back then like the world was different and things just had different abilities. So when it comes right. through a time slip, those abilities come with it and it's just we don't understand. It's like, oh, this is it's, good stuff for my books, man. I'm going to I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> is it magical and paranormal or is that the norm back then? Ah, maybe. Yeah. They could, they could alter reality, shape the world. I think I really like this badger otter uh, explanation or something like that, certainly. Yeah. I, I mean, it kind, of, it kind of blends with the already unknown, you know, giant otter. And, you know, who knows, maybe someday someone will take a close look at that taxidermy in County Mayo and pluck would, a hair and see what's up. I would be curious to see. I mean, just even anatomy alone, like I would like, even someone like Justin, Mr. E, to take a look at the taxidermy and just see if, like, okay, is this anatomically correct? Is this even – does this even make sense? Does the animal look real? Does it look like a recreation? He's, he'll probably look at it and be like, oh, no, that's, you know, that's a a rabbit from, you know, Scandinavia <laughs> for – I can tell by it, the pattern around its ear <laughs> – could be, yeah. We need we need Mr. E to take a look at, at this taxidermy. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's that's what I got for you as far as the Dobarku goes. Um, it's a cool it's a cool cryptid. I like it a lot. I think that it's completely biologically reasonable. Yeah. Um, and and clearly we have uh, examples of modern otters that are are quite large, and in the past, wolf sized otters. In the badger otter. Right, yeah. I mean, I I wouldn't I can't I can't rule this one out as being like story, you know, just a story or just a folklore or even a hoax or anything. Um, you know, I like to believe that most of the stuff that we talk about in the show is real or was real at some point. This is one of the ones I'm you know, putting in the category of probably was real. Like in my head, I'm that's I'm kind of the same. I think, think it actually happened. Yeah, yeah. But either way, it is a marvelous marine mystery. Oh, I like it. An MMM. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we got, I think that's probably a good spot to end it, don't you think? I think so. I think that we, we covered some, some good stuff here. I like the Dobarku, and I too think that it just might have been out there. I'm with you on that. I agree. So... <laughs> I've been J Clone seventy seven, and I am Michael Thompson. You want to promote any of your uh, books again? Real Check quick? out the Winslow Hoffner series on MichaelThompsonBooks dot com. Check out my Instagram at mthompson underscore books for all sorts of cool cryptid stuff, and and find us at uh, some cool upcoming cryptid festivals. Both of us, um, I'll, I too will be at Encounter Quest, and I'm looking forward to it. That's going to be a fun time. Woohoo! Yeah. I'm looking forward yeah. to seeing you there. I think that's the yeah. next time we'll be seeing each other in person. Most definitely. I'll have all the Winslow books. I'll have the audiobook as well, which is now uh, on Kobo. So you can check that out at the top of my website, michaelthompsonbooks.com. Listen to the trailer 
and hear all the cool voices. I do all the voices in the audiobook. Oh, that makes and it even I'll better. I'll have that in hard copy as well at the at the festivals we mentioned. Oh, good. So that's Encounter Quest, April 12th, 13th, and 14th in Hamlin, yeah. North Carolina. Yeah. So hopefully we see you guys there. So For sure. until the next time, bye. Bye. Hey, guys. Thank you for listening to Crippens the Corn Podcast. Remember, the best way to support the show is share it with a friend. But if you are craving more of the J clones and more from Mr. E, there's always extra content on Patreon and our paid member space on cryptidsofthecorn.com. We'll catch you next time with more exciting, fun, and informative information. Bye! Bye.